Thank you, Paul. So welcome everyone. Um, as I stated earlier, welcome to the 164th edition of the monthly luncheon for the Rocky Mountain chapter of Society for American Baseball Research. Um, as you may have heard, we have a very special guest today. Uh, Mr. Brad Lidge has graciously offered to join us and talk about what's going on in his world. Um, you all probably should know who Brad is, but in case you do not, he's a former uh, and, Major League Baseball All-Star and World Series participant um, as a relief pitcher for several teams, including the Philadelphia Phillies. He is also a prodigal son here of the state of Colorado, so we uh, we definitely worship the ground he walks on. So, oh. um, <laughs> for, based on that, um, I will just give some uh, administrative um, housekeeping items uh, for this virtual monthly luncheon. Um, we have muted everybody except myself, Mr. Paul Parker, the president. Um, Paul, if you could just raise your hand, who will be the moderator for the discussion with Brad Lidge and Mr. Lidge himself. Um, we will possibly and most likely take questions for Brad. Um, if you could submit them through the chat box, that would be great. That way we can uh, make sure we get the question accurately and, and, rep and represent it perfectly to Mr. Lidge. So you should have a chat box function up there. So while Paul and Brad are speaking back and forth, I will uh, keep uh, tabs on that. And then when the time comes, we will work with uh, Paul and Brad to make sure your questions are answered. And then afterwards, there might be some time uh, for a general discussion, um, which I will then we will then unmute participants if they have a question just for general discussion. If that comes to be, we ask that you do the hand raising. There should be a hand raising function in there, and we will be able to unmute you for your general question. So with that being said, I'll hand it over to you, Paul. Okay, thank you, Alex, and, um, and thank you for uh, um, functioning as our uh, executive producer of this uh, event today. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see uh, lots of familiar faces, and uh, I guess we just went to a second page, so uh, more people are joining us as we go here. A um, couple of housekeeping uh, things before we uh, dive in here. Um, because of, of, for obvious reasons, the pandemic, um, we will not be meeting in person at our Blake Street Tavern location, which we have traditionally done um, in the months of August or September. And um, we are uh, going to make a final decision probably within 10 days or so about our annual banquet, which always takes place in uh, November. We do have two dates on hold, the first two Saturdays in November with Coors Field. And I'm, I'm in touch with uh, the Rockies. And um, of course, they're our host there of venue. And um, it's, uh, it doesn't look promising right now in terms of a, a November banquet. So uh, of course, we will continue to um, stay in touch with the Blake Street Tavern with the Colorado Rockies and uh, monitor things as we go. And we will inform our membership at, um, as, uh, as they say, as uh, information becomes available. But in the meantime, we're doing these virtual meetings uh, each month. And I, I hope, uh, I know quite a few of you have uh, joined us on previous ones and I hope um, you find that enjoyable. We've had some nice, uh, uh, some very interesting and really good guests um, leading up to this and uh, to this month. And um, so, with that, uh, Alex has already told you something about uh, Brad Lidge. Um, and I, of course, tried to do my homework as well. Uh, not, he's not quite in a, he was born in Sacramento, California. Stop, Brad and Brad, I want you to stop, you know, if you hear anything that's not accurate, please correct. I'll jump us. in, I'll jump in. Yeah, cut me off actually. Okay. No. <laughs> um, born in uh, Sacramento, California, but is a uh, graduate of Cherry Creek High School in Denver and um, was uh, drafted by the San Francisco Giants, did not sign, and then was uh, drafted by the Houston Astros and did sign. Had uh, some great years with Houston and then of course with the Phillies, uh, um, culminating in, well, I know it's culminating, but his uh, um, probably best known in the baseball world for his perfect uh, season of 2008 when the Phillies won the World Series and uh, Brad was a perfect 48 for 48 in save opportunities 
including 41 saves in the regular season and seven in the postseason. Okay, you haven't interrupted me yet, so I guess that's a good So start. far, so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Brad did want to uh, – uh, Brad also went to the University of Notre Dame and also uh, now holds a master's degree in um, – and you, Brad um, – Fill in the blank here. You have a master's degree from the University of Leicester in England. Leicester. Okay, and and your master's degree is in uh, ancient Roman archaeology. Ancient Roman archaeology. So this is not a not a um, typical relief former relief pitcher here. A little atypical, but um, uh, Brad was our keynote speaker at a at our one of our banquets a uh, number of years ago, about six seven years ago. Uh, and he was on the program with uh, Ty Cobb's uh, grandson, Herschel Cobb, who had just wrote, mm -hmm. written a book about his grandfather, um, The Heart of a Tiger. And um, so um, he is now a Colorado resident still, and he uh, is, now I'm reading from notes here, he is an analyst for the MLB Network on Sirius XM. And he's also uh, in doing some lim limited work as a special assistant for the Philadelphia Phillies. And um, we are uh, pleased, delighted, and honored to welcome him to our Zoom today. So thank you, Brad, for, uh, for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Paul, for the, for the introduction. And, and the only thing I would really add to that is uh, I was born in Sacramento, <clears throat> uh, but only lived there for about a year and a half, two years before I moved to Colorado. So I, I don't remember it at all. Uh, of course, and uh, you know, Colorado for me is my is my only home, um, for, at least for as far as memories go. And uh, we were very excited to be able to move back here when I when I did in fact retire in 2013. Okay, well, um, to begin with, uh, as we all know, baseball in a very um, changed form is back. So, um, yeah, um, and of course. Uh, Nobody's going to be signing Dr. Anthony Fauci as a free agent anytime soon, if you caught, caught a glimpse of that. Um, but I did hear that that, uh, that pitch he threw was, uh, uh, he was called a flattened curve. So, <laughs> not original material, but, um, but now we are back. The Rockies uh, crank it up tonight in, down, in, uh, down in Texas at a brand new ballpark. They're helping the Rangers to open. And... Um, but I, I would, what I'd like to do is um, hear Brad's um, thoughts and impressions on uh, this unique 2020 baseball season and what we can expect, in, not in a marathon, but in a sprint. So, Brad? Yeah, well, you know, um, Paul, I'll tell you what, and, and uh, I think everyone, I, I know all of you certainly uh, that follow the game the way you do know that this is going to be uh, a very odd year uh, because it's not it's not baseball as we know it. It's not a regular season as we know it. Uh, it is not that marathon um, that that teams build depth for uh, to be able to last 162 games. Uh, it's a 60 game sprint where you know anomalies are going to happen. Uh, teams that probably by and large should not be in the race might very well be. Um, you could I guess extend that to the Colorado Rockies even if you will uh, because I. I you know, traditionally, even the Rockies get off to really good starts and on years that don't necessarily go well for them. Sometimes that doesn't pan out until July. So I really think this kind of allows a lot of teams in the mix. Um, and then to top that off, yesterday, uh, the Players Union and MLB agreed to uh, expand the playoffs to 16 teams. So we're really seeing a, a very odd mix. And, and that is going to allow certainly uh, some teams you would not anticipate being in the postseason in 2020 to be in it. Um, there is definitely some odd rule changes that are going to be happening this year that as a reliever, I cannot stand. Uh, the fact that in extra innings, uh, a runner is going to be starting on second base. Um, and it's kind of just a, you know, uh, a way to speed up extra inning process to not waste guys when we have such a condensed game, 60 games in 66 days. Um, but I'll tell you what, there's, there's no worse thought in my mind than having to come into a game with a runner on second base. Cause as a relief pitcher, you'd like to come into a game always uh, with nobody on base. So you can kind of get into a groove and a rhythm. Now you're putting a guy at second base with nobody out. 
And, uh, you know, it's, it just is not going to be comfortable for any relievers. So um, it's going to be a very odd season. You got the designated hitter in both leagues. Um, I think we're going to see some massive offensive numbers this year. And like I said, the biggest difference for me is that those teams that are built for the marathon this year that are built to win in 162 games, um, you know, it's too bad for them because they might not get to that depth in their, on their team that in their roster, it might be the teams that stay healthiest uh, for these 60 games that end up getting to the postseason. And we've already seen the Washington nationals lose their uh, star outfielder Juan Soto. And now they're in a lot of trouble offensively. So uh, it, it might just come down to the guys that, and we've talked about this a lot on my radio show, who can really stay in the guys in the clubhouse. Can they really be accountable to each other? Stay out of nightclubs. You know, when you're traveling on the road, just go back to your hotel. Can you really be accountable to your teammates and do everything right? And then even if you're doing everything right this year and you don't, you know, get the virus and, and bring it home, can you actually get it? Because maybe you're in a hotel that wasn't sanitized properly. So there's just a lot of things that, I'm sorry, I got to uh, figure out how to mute my phone here. That, that might be the commissioner calling. <laughs> Brad, stop, stop talking. Uh, uh, but, but so anyway, for all those reasons, 2020 to me is just going to be a bizarre season. I, I'm actually really looking forward to it for certain reasons too, though, because, you know, when you, anytime you tell me that there's going to be less games in a season, I know we like 162 players wanted less uh, players probably will always want a little bit less, but when there's only 60 and each one is going to essentially account for uh, you know, almost three times a normal game's importance. That means everything is on the line right from the get-go. It's the playoff stretch. So that should create a lot of general excitement around the game. Hopefully not just for fans of the game, but for people uh, that are, you know, not necessarily uh, people that are watching baseball all the time, but maybe just in the playoff stretch. Well, now, right from day one, we are kind of in that stretch. So I hope it'll bring in a new crowd of people. It certainly should bring some excitement to the game. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. It's what we have. We, you know, whether we like it or not, it's what we have. So hopefully we can embrace it. Brad, I, I want to ask you about a couple of unique things that are going on this year and your general impressions of them. I, I've seen, of course, the stadiums are empty. But uh, I, at least last night in, in Washington, there were uh, in, down behind home plate, in, downstairs in the infield, there were several hundred cardboard cutouts of people. And yeah. also they're pumping in art, artificial crowd noise. What are your, what are your feelings on that? Um, yeah, well, I, I'll tell you, I think, um, I think it might be better than doing nothing. Um, I think that the artificial crowd noise uh, if done right, is not necessarily a bad thing. Look, the whole, you know, not having a crowd there issue, it, it is a big deal, and especially a big deal for relief pitchers who are used to pitching in front of 50,000 screaming people, especially if you're a closer at the end of games, and you need that adrenaline. Um, there's no sounds they can pump in to artificially create that. A, a closer is going to know when he comes into the game that there's nobody there. And, uh, you know, it's it's – it's tricky in some senses because as your career progresses in baseball, you use that extra adrenaline that comes from pitching at home or even on the road when the crowd is against you and yelling stuff. After a while, that's kind of what you need is a trigger to lock yourself in when you're pitching and you get used to that stuff. And that kind of helps you get your right mindset and focus. Uh, there's none of that happening. And so I think it'll be Paul actually, you know, not having the crowd there and, and, and I'm kind of circumventing this, uh, uh, your question, I'll get back to it in a second, but not having a crowd there for relievers is going to be a double-edged sword. For closers who have pitched for a long time, they're going to sorely miss the adrenaline and they're going to feel like it's kind of spring training-ish and maybe not necessarily have their best stuff. On the other hand, you're going to have guys in the bullpen that uh, maybe all the, you know, the crowd noise and everything else kind of gets to them a little bit. Maybe there's some young guys that uh, will benefit from not having all those people there. So I think you're going to see both things. Um, but at the end of the day, a little bit of generic crowd noise uh, is probably better than not. A, a couple days ago, there was an exhibition game. I was watching Arizona, and there was a, a delay with the crowd noise. A pitcher struck a guy out for Arizona, and then the ball gets thrown around and gets back to him. He gets back on the mound, and all of a sudden, there's this applause that comes in. It's about the <laughs> second plate. So if they don't mess it up, and I guess everyone needs a little bit of spring training on that, but if they don't mess it up, it should be better than nothing. Uh, the, the cardboard cutouts of the fans, um, boy, I don't know. I think that's kind of a... Sorry, I'm going to get my phone. I don't know. Can you guys hear that on your end? I got to get my yeah, uh, loud and clear. <laughs> okay, well, good. Uh, it's, it, that's me. If you're wondering, um, I got to get my phone disconnected <laughs> okay, here. Okay, you're the guest. <laughs> uh, give me one second. I'll get my phone disconnected. 
uh, from everything. But, uh, you know, essentially, um, the cardboard cutouts, I don't really know what to say about that. I don't think it's a huge deal. I think it's a very strange um, thing to put out there. Uh, but again, maybe better than nothing, just as a visual aid for the players to make it look a little bit more like normal. So I, I'm not going to say it's a negative thing to have either one of those, as long as they're done correctly. It's just, you, you just can't fake the actual fans there. Uh, and, and I don't think that they should pretend that they can. Okay. Uh, if we could uh, turn our attention now, uh, your attention to um, the National League West specifically, of course, we're going to play uh, is it two thirds of all our games, 40? 40 of the 60 games are gonna be against our, uh, the Rockies uh, four uh, National League West rivals. Um, in terms of the Dodgers now, the Dodgers have now lo um, lost uh, initially at least Clayton Kershaw with his uh, usual back problems. And of course, David Price opted out of uh, playing this season so the Dodgers are down to their last uh, 20 or 25 All-Stars, I think. And, yeah. uh, so, exactly. But how do you see the National League West uh, playing out uh, until the end of September? Well, it's definitely going to be a challenge for the Rockies. I think, um, you know, for me, it's uh, – it's, 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 this is the Dodgers division. And even without Price, even without Kershaw, you know, Walker Buehler is more than capable of being an ace in this staff. And, and the depth that they have, you know, we saw May pitch last night throwing 99 mile an hour sinkers. Um, you know, they have so much depth in that rotation. The Dodgers are one of those teams that uh, they're not just deep, but they're also extraordinarily talented. And so they kind of had like a rotation A and a rotation B. And if they lose guys in that starting rotation, you know, guys like Ross Stripling, who kind of go back and forth from the rotation of the bullpen, but he was an all-star last year. Uh, he can just plug right into that rotation. So they, unfortunately for the Rockies, are not going to be, you know, really able to, you, you can't really take advantage of those injuries too much. They're still going to win this division, in my opinion. Mookie Betts is unfortunately going to be there for 12 years if you're a Rockies fan. Um, I, I do think that um, the Arizona Diamondbacks have a absolutely loaded offense this year. I, I think that that, you know, Mad Bum leading that that pitching rotation will give the rest of them a lot of life and will will speed up their learning curve as young pitchers. Um, and I like Arizona. I don't like their bullpen necessarily a ton, but I think Arizona is going to be a tough team to beat. San Diego is going to be a very tough team to beat this year. And I think a lot of people are kind of choosing them as a one of these kind of up and coming teams that could get into the postseason this year now that it's 16 teams, especially. Um, the rotation is very young, but it's very talented. Their Padres bullpen is loaded and uh, their offense is strong. Uh, so I think they're going to be a challenge as well. Now, the Giants are clearly in rebuilding mode. And when Buster Posey bowed out for the season, uh, it kind of just put an exclamation point on that. So, look, I, I think it's going to be a very challenging division this year for the Rockies. The Rockies have to get that bullpen sorted out. And, but, you know, those are really, really good names in the bullpen. And if they can have a good season and if the Rockies, at least good 60 games, and if the Rockies can get off to a good start the way they have often done in the past, uh, it's very possible because it's 2020 – uh, that they could get into the postseason, and uh, it really just will require uh, the bullpen being strong. In my opinion, the bullpen is going to be the most valuable asset for any team this year because starters are not going to go as deep into games. You've got more guys out there in the bullpen, so the bullpens are going to be used a ton. If Wade Davis and, the, and company out there can get it done early, then the Rockies have a path to the postseason. And I understand uh, what they announced yesterday. <clears throat> the the uh, expanded playoffs will now include a series of um, best two out of three first rounds. And, uh, and then the, 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 then the second round will be three out of fives. So if a team gets hot and very hot, they can, uh, they can progress pretty far in this uh, abbreviated regular season, expanded postseason. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a strange deal. You know, I, I kind of go back to the, to the Washington Nationals of last year because – you know, they were a team that barely made the postseason. Uh, you know, they got off to a bad, real bad start. I mean, the team was like, they were talking about dismantling it. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, they win the World Series. And when you have a powerful rotation at the top, uh, you know, one, two, three rotation like that, if you can just sneak into the postseason, um, you've got a good chance to go deep because you mentioned the best out of three, that's the first series. Uh, you know, I, I think the Nationals, look, if, if, if you told me the Nationals, had, you know, maybe playing the Dodgers, in that best out of three, if it's the one versus eight seed, um, 
the Nationals can pretty much beat anybody really in the National League. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you just got to get in. And then you're right, Paul, if you get hot at the right time and you've got some good starters at the top that are firing on all cylinders, you can get through the first and second rounds as they will have them this year uh, and get to those seven game series, the championship series, and, and potentially even the World Series. But um, it's really, buddy, it's really anybody's for the taking early on. When you play a best out of three series, I don't care if you're the Yankees or the Dodgers or whoever, you can get beat two games in, you know, two games out of three at any time in the season, no matter how good you are. And um, uh, speaking of uh, getting hot at the right time, of course, most of us here are uh, Rockies aficionados and we very well remember uh, 2007 and how hot the Rockies got and, and sprinted to the world series. Uh, so let's, uh, if we could turn our attention to the, um, to the local nine here, uh, you, you know, obviously you, you talk about the bull, bullpen a lot. The Rockies just made some uh, significant uh, bullpen uh, moves by releasing uh, Brian Shaw and Jake McGee. Um, of course, that would, they, were, they were in the last years of, uh, of their contracts. And uh, it, it, um, is this correct, uh, Brad? They are, they're all, the, the Rockies were only on the hook for it for the prorated, prorated amount of their last year of their contracts. So it's not that we're, we're going to pay them $9 million. And then, so we're, we, and they both signed with other teams already, right? Yeah. And, and so it, it is an interesting year to, to do a move like that. It doesn't hurt the Rockies as much for that reason. You're, you're, you're doing a prorated salary anyways. I mean, it's never good to, to sign guys to kind of bigger contracts and then end up, you know, in the last year, you know, releasing them, um, that, that doesn't mean that, they're, that things panned out well. Uh, but that being said, this is a way to get out from underneath uh, some of that money. Um, it thins out the Rockies' bullpen a little bit, but it also makes room for some of the younger guys that, that are ready to go up and to take those roles. And I think this is a year where the, the Rockies need to see if those guys are ready. You know, the, the other guys just are, are battling, they're struggling, and uh, it's unfortunate because um, they're talented pitchers, but they just haven't been able to get it done. And, and uh, you know, I think – I think, again, I'll go back to saying, you know, Wade Davis, if he can have a good run this year, I, I don't want to say like he's the X factor. It all depends on him. Of course, that's just not the case. But I feel like a lot really does depend on him. If he can be the guy that he's been in the past versus, you know, last year, it could really mean the difference of three or four games for the Rockies this year. And that could be, you know, whether you get into the postseason or not. Okay. And um, staying with the Rockies, uh, now you're, you're a radio analyst and I would – I would hope that you feel free to speak frankly here, but um, in terms of Nolan Arenado and Jeff Breidish, there's much has been made locally of, and, and nationally of um, the um, uh, disagreement. I'm searching for the right word here. The, yeah. the uh, difference of opinion, the, the, the conflict, if you will. How do you see the Nolan Arenado long-term situation playing out here in Denver? Well, I think, you know, part of, part of the deal initially was that, you know, that the Rockies were factoring in, um, you know, obviously that Arenado would want to be here. Um, and, and they structured a contract in a way that, look, uh, you know, if, if, if Arenado wants to get out of here, he can. But that's, you know, that was kind of something that they, they all felt comfortable doing at the time. Um, I, I'm a little bit frustrated with how the, the dialogue has played out. Um, and uh, between, you know, Arenado and Breidich, I, I just don't think uh, Breidich has said some of the right things at the right time. Um, I mean, I, I try not to be biased and take, you know, the player's side on these things. I, I try and really kind of look at it objectively. But um, I, I think that uh, if you're Arenado, why, why don't you have every right to say, I want to win, I want to be a part of a winning team, and that's what I want to do in my career? Like, you have every right to say that. And uh, if you call out the front office because – you feel they're not doing stuff correctly, um, you know, th then you better have a good reason for it. But I feel like he kind of did. So um, I, I feel like, you know, I don't like the way this thing kind of played out. And I feel like it might not end up well long term, but it's because Arenado wants to win. And I, I think that this kind of weird little year will go a long ways into, into kind of the mindset of what Arenado uh, is going to have here. And, and uh, you know, if he's going to get moved, if he's going to be traded, um, then, you know, that's obviously going to hurt a lot of Rockies fans and, and it's going to make a lot of Rockies uh, upset. But 
Um, if the Rockies can come out and do well this year, then maybe there's a you know, light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe an Arenado sees some things that make him want to stay around. And, and regardless of the conversations he's had, um, it's enough. So um, I don't know how it's going to play out. I don't you know, know Arenado you know, very well other than just meeting him a few times. But I know that he is somebody that really wants to win and, and he wants that attached to his name at the end of the day. He'd love to do it here. I mean, he really would. You know, this would be his first choice. But uh, at some point in your career, you get to a spot where if you don't see that light at the end of the tunnel, you're going to want to move on. If you're a veteran player, you're going to want to go to a team uh, to where, you know, you know the front office is going to put everything in to win. And uh, I think the Rockies right now are, you know, they've, they've tried some things that haven't worked out. And so now they're kind of taking a step back and saying, okay, we need to reassess. And I don't think he wants to be a part of that reassessment. Okay, I'd also like to ask you about one other player on the Rockies, and, and this is uh, kind of fast developing in the last 24 hours, um, and that is Brendan Rodgers. And he was kind of the um, a darling of some in terms of, uh, uh, he was a first round pick, I think he was third overall or fifth overall in the first round in 2015. And he has, uh, in the, I saw in the Denver Post this morning, Brendan Rodgers, healthy Brendan Rodgers, has been left off the uh, 30-man roster. He's, he's in the satellite. And they've gone, they're going with, at least initially, uh, um, the Cuz, Josh Fuentes, Nolan's cousin, and Chris Owings, who made a surprise, surprise move to make the roster. What, what, are your, what, what are your thoughts on Brendan Rodgers and the Rockies? Well, yeah, I, I, I briefly know, like, saw that, and I don't um... – I don't exactly know what the rationale was for that. It's, it's tough to, I mean, I haven't, you know, seen what the Rockies reasoning is to, to not have them on the, the roster. It's, it's definitely surprising for me. I mean, you're talking about a, you know, as you said, a super high draft pick who's kind of proven everything he needs to prove in the minor leagues. Um, he's, he's had big numbers. He's been an organizational player of the year. He's, he's ready to kind of jump. So I, I, I hate to, think that it has something to do with service time or anything like that? I don't know. I haven't investigated this one enough to know why the Rockies are leaving him off. Um, but look, I mean, organizations have to be smart. If they feel like he's going to be a big part of the future and they can get an extra year uh, out of him without having to, you know, have, having him become a free agent. Um, I, I think that organizations, I'm not saying that's the case here, but I, I think that organizations need to be more forthright when something like that happens. They have every right to say, we want this guy another year longer. Uh, you know, and, and uh, it's just that the players union will say, well, hold on, if he's ready for the major leagues, he needs to be in the major leagues. Otherwise, we're going to file a grievance. But they'll never win that argument because, again, it's up to the organization to determine when a player is ready and when they're not ready. They have the final say. And, and if they want to keep a guy an extra year, uh, you, you can't blame them. It's not a bad move organizationally. It's not a bad move for the club. But it's just uh, a little bit frustrating for, for Rockies fans in 2020 that want to see what this guy can do, uh, you know, playing every single day. And I, I can't blame fans for wanting to see that. So, unfortunately, there are some reasons for fans to be a little disgruntled right now at the Rockies in that front office. There's no doubt about it. But, um, you know, hopefully things work out better than even the Rockies are thinking this year so that guys like Arenado will, will want to stick around and want to play here for a long time. But they, they need – they need to make some you know, good decisions that are going to get fans excited about the team this year. Uh, and of course, the, um, th there's a, 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 I don't know, Tori, there's a good example of this issue coming up previously with the Chicago Cubs. And when Chris Bryant first uh, yes. was first coming up and the Cubs, um, um, to some manipulated his uh, call up in order to extend his uh, or limit his service time initially. Um, now, uh, I uh, also want to ask, uh, before we open it up to uh, questions from, the, from everybody, uh, I have one more, uh, more general baseball question for you, and that's um, uh, looking ahead to uh, 2021 and 2022. The, the collective bargaining agreement is due to um, expire at the end of next season, and that is... Uh, that is a big dragon looming on the horizon. And if, if anything, uh, baseball is the best sport around at uh, killing the golden goose, if you will. Yeah. And, and um, how, do you, uh, how do you foresee uh, that playing out, the CBA and, and with, with Commissioner Manfred at the helm um, and, and what, might, what might happen there? 
Yeah, it, well, I, I will tell you right now, it's ugly. Um, you know, the players union has a complete lack of trust uh, with Rob Manfred and MLB and the, and the owners themselves. Um, and, and that's what happens when, when you make a statement, you know, as brash as Manfred did that, that you know, to say, we're, I guarantee we're going to have a season and then to say, ah, I don't know if we're going to. Um, using all these different tactics to try and, uh, you know, ha have a strategy um, to, to do what he could to, um, to, to prove, to, I guess, to provide a case for ownership and MLB to not give the players what they probably thought they were going to get this year. Um, now, look, I, again, I try and be objective. I, I will say this year more than any other year in my life, um, I have really kind of thought, wow, the, the MLB, Manfred, the, the owners have done a really bad job negotiating in good faith. Like, I, I, do, I just don't think they did it at all this year. Um, the players union, maybe they could have been a little bit more uh, uh, amenable. Maybe they could have been a little bit more flexible, uh, budged a little bit. But that being said, they really did, uh, you know, just in, in my opinion, they got, they got the raw, raw end of the deal for sure. And, and that's going to stick around now. So what does that mean for 2021? Well, right now the players union is very upset at the commissioner. And uh, after next season happens, you know, we have our collective bargaining agreement. It's going to get ugly. It's going to be bad. And there is going to be absolutely, my guess is tons of, you know, threat, threatening of, you know, of a strike and everything else. We've seen that always kind of happen before and it plays out. And most of the time these things get done, even when there's hurt feelings. Uh, but I think there's a legitimate chance that could happen now because, um, you know, the way this thing ended up, the players are really upset and they're going to demand a ton from Manfred and the owners and MLB. And I don't know if they're going to be willing to do that. And I think at some point, um, you know, the players will, will kind of just say, fine, we're done negotiating then. Until this happens, we're, we're done. Now, two things that obviously the collective bargaining process has going for it. Uh, number one, uh, the, the players and the owners are making a lot of money. The owners are doing really well. So I can't imagine a world in which the owners are doing so well and not wanting to have players play. Uh, so I think there will have to be some flexibility there. Um, owners continue to do, you know, you, you see these huge bumps in, in what these team values are. The players continue to make more money than ever. So when everyone's getting paid better than they've ever been paid, like why would you go to a strike? So that doesn't make a ton of sense. So they've got that going for it. Uh, and then also they've got the fact that this year, uh, the players are not making nearly what they have or what they expected to, you know, six months ago. So um, that also is going to weigh on the players saying, you know, we, we already made like half of what we were going to make or less than half of what we were going to make in 2020. Can we also then say that we maybe are going to go have a strike after 2021 and not get paid for 2022 as well? Uh, that starts to really eat at some guys. And, and you know, if you're uh, you know, a young player and you know you only have a certain window to be making major league money, um, I don't think you're going to want to miss half of 2020 and then maybe half of 2022 or yeah, 2022. So uh, I think it, so that's the factors that the collective bargaining has going for it. Uh, but there's a lot of hurt feelings right now. And, and the players union is very upset. So you are um, uh, pessimistic you're, and not cautiously pessimistic. You're pretty, you, you don't. Well, put it, yeah. Put it this way. I, I'm pessimistic in, in terms of the, the relationship between the players union and MLB. I, I think it's as bad as it's been in a very long time. Uh, but I think also there, there's reason, like, like I would also say I'm cautiously optimistic because I think money is such a big fact. I mean, I hate to say it, but money is a, a, the, the big factor at the end of the day. And if the players don't get paid what they were going to this year, uh, and they run the risk of not doing that in 2022. Also, eventually that starts to really hit home. And so you might be willing to negotiate more because of that. And, and because everyone is getting as much as they are, I think that uh, it ends up being an optimist. You know, you could almost take it as an optimistic view. So relationship wise, it's really bad. But, you know, wallet wise, I think people are going to have to make some tough decisions and just, and just go ahead and be upset. Well, uh, let's, let's turn uh to uh, some questions here from um, from the group here. This is from Christopher Cohen, who I see is on the call here. Uh, he His question is, um, based on your experience in the 2008 World Series Game 5, what advice would you have for players should the season be paused from this point onward as a result of the pandemic? Uh, well, that's a great question uh, because the experience we had in game five in 2008, we had our, it was really hard to be patient. We had our first half of the game played out. Then the, then the second half was delayed. Uh, then the next day, the game was delayed again. 
and we had to wait till a third day to actually finish that game five in 2008. Uh, so we had to exercise a lot of patience. Um, so I guess that would be that would be you know something that you would have to tell the players. You're, you're going to have to have extraordinary patience with this thing. Um, if if the virus ends up shutting down this season, I think that was the question. What you know what advice if, if the virus shuts down the season? Now is it is it delays the season or shuts down the season? Was that the was the question delayed? Uh, the question was um, what advice would you have for players should the season be paused? Pause. Delayed, I guess, from this point onward. Yeah. So, well, I guess you'd have to go back to doing what you've done over the last couple months. And, and it's, it's not, it's almost in certain ways not good enough because you're not going to have all of a sudden, you know, three weeks to ramp back up like they just did. But I don't know what you can, honestly, like, what can you do as a player? Like, if the season gets paused this year, it might, that, that, if it's more than a week or two, I don't think they're going to continue to have the season. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to run in against the NBA and the NFL. Uh, and and I, I know that they didn't want to have – MLB didn't want to have stuff run into November this year because they were so worried that, you know, people, quite frankly, wouldn't be watching if you get into November. Um, and so I don't – and plus, weather would just be a huge issue at that point. So I, I don't know I, – I guess the best advice would to try and just be to have patience with it, but I'm not sure you could do anything to keep yourself physically and mentally ready more than you just did over those you know long two-and-a-half-month pause we just had or three months or whatever it was. I don't think there's more that you can do. You can go to your you know, place where you worked out, get in the batting cage, throw it to hitters because, listen, during this break, every, almost every major league player that I talked to was able to get to a facility – and still have their workouts. Pitching to guys, hitters were able to see live pitching. Now it's all inside cages, it's not outdoors, uh, but they were able to work out together and to get something going. And that's kind of what they'd have to jump back into if there is a pause or delay. It would suck. Uh, you have these huge you know, emotional swings of adrenaline and then not, and then adrenaline and not. Um, it's just an extraordinary year. I hope there isn't a pause, but I would also say that if there was a pause or a delay that's two weeks or more, uh, I just don't think the season would continue. I think it would just be over. And uh, if it does uh, get pushed back or delayed, uh, I would think uh, baseball would be concerned about uh, chop cutting into the uh, to the off season if if baseball has hopes of any kind of normalcy for 2021. And you know because if, if they're playing the postseason in November, how you know it's not very far to pitches and catches reporting in February if if 2021 resembles normalcy at all. They don't want to go there either. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing to remember is that all of a sudden, you know, are you trying to force this season in so much? Uh, if things did get worse and there was a pause, you're trying to force it in so much that now you're messing with 2021 also. Um, that doesn't seem to be a good idea. Uh, you know, I think it's really important for MLB, you know, to have jumped back on the field this year and to do everything they can to keep the season going uh, because fans – are going to be if baseball gets shut down, fans will remember the, the hostile negotiations that happened. I think right now baseball is in a pretty good spot. I think people have forgotten about how bad you know the arguments were between the players' union and uh, and, and ownership. Uh, but the reason it's going better now is because the product is back on the field. And and if baseball can have a fun, exciting 60 game run, then no one is really going to remember. People are just going to remember that this year didn't really happen because of of COVID, not because. Uh, or the beginning part of the year didn't happen because of COVID, not because of bad relationship and, 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 and uh, you know, different arguments that they had. So I think baseball needs this year to happen so that people, uh, you know, are, are just think that the first part didn't happen because of COVID and everything else was fine. That, that's what baseball would like. Okay. Let's Paul, go to Paul can I just, Paul, can I interrupt a quick second? Sure. Uh, just so the, for those who joined late, um, we are taking questions through the chat box. So, um, you know, don't raise your hand quite yet. Just submit questions through the chat box, please. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, this next question is from Chris Moyer. And Chris says, uh, Brad, do you have a favorite minor league moment? Also, what, is you, what was your favorite moment that you had with Roy Halladay? Um, so two good questions. Um, a favorite minor league moment. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, so I'll go to uh, 1999, my first full minor league season. I got drafted in 98. So 1999, I'm with the Kissimmee Cobras in uh, Kissimmee, Florida. And uh, 
I've been injured most of the entire season, but the team is actually playing really well. And, and I'm, I'm having kind of a lot of fun just being around the group of guys. Uh, we actually won the uh, Florida State League championship that year. And, uh, you know, we have some nice little rings with a cobra and a little like tiny, tiny little diamond in its eye, which I, which I uh, hold, hold dearly. Um, and uh, we had a really, really fun year. I still have a good relationship with a lot of the guys from that team. So I think, um, you know, in terms of the minor leagues, that would probably be my, my favorite moment uh, just because it was a really fun thing to do as a team. I had so many injuries in the minor leagues. There wasn't really a whole lot of, I mean, I had some good games that stood out. I had some, you know, good games I pitched in Round Rock and, and, and New Orleans, but um, I think that would be my favorite moment uh, from the minor leagues. And then um, memories with Roy Holiday. Uh, well, I, I think two of them kind of really, I guess, stump, stand out in my mind. Uh, the first was, when he threw the no hitter in the, in the playoffs in his first ever game, um, just because afterward I could see such great relief in his eyes and such a, uh, you know, he, he's such a workhorse and he's always so concerned about, you know, getting out there and giving everything has, it was like from one of the first times I'd seen him kind of just like take an exhale. Uh, and granted it wasn't for a couple hours after the game, but, but finally there was an exhale there. And I felt like, man, he really has that, you know, that off his back, he hadn't pitched in a playoff game and he goes out there and throws a no hitter. So that was a huge thing for him. I think a huge moment. And, you know, also just being on, uh, you know, different bus rides or, or planes with, with Roy and, and sitting down and, you know, he, he liked playing the guitar and uh, we, we'd, uh, we'd have some good conversations and, you know, Roy was a guy who was very serious and uh, you know, was always thinking about baseball, but every once in a while he'd relax and, and, and just, uh, uh, we talk about other stuff and, you know, play the guitar or whatever. So that, that's a great memory for me as well with, with Roy uh, in terms of when I was with him in the Phillies, with the Phillies. Did you feel a special bond because you were both uh, native Coloradans with Roy? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I actually, uh, even in Little League, played against Roy. And, and the extraordinary thing about Roy is that, um, you know, he was a dominant, you know, super tall, threw harder than everybody, dominant pitcher, even in Little League. And 99% of the time, those guys don't continue, you know, a meteoric rise through their entire life. But he, but he did. And uh, that's a very, very unusual thing. And it's a lot of credit to him that he had the uh, mental capacity to be able to kind of have that hoisted on him every single year of his life and continue to meet expectations. Um, and so, uh, it's, it's, you know, we got to play against each other in like the Colorado state all-star game. Uh, we got to play against each other in the championship game. Uh, our, our, you know, fortunately for us, Cherry Creek high school, we were able to beat him in our battle West to win the state championship in 95. And, uh, so sure. I brought that up a few times when I played with Roy and, uh, you know, we, we definitely had a, a bond because of that. And, uh, you know, my wife knew Brandy well, uh, we knew his family pretty well. We were at a lot of functions together over the years. So we had, we had a lot to talk about and, um, you know, but obviously Roy moved out of Colorado down to uh, Dunedin and stayed there, you know, for a large, large part of his life as well. So, but we had that connection for sure coming out of Colorado. Okay. Our next question is from our vice president, Kurt Wells, right? Kurt, wave your hand. There he is. Uh, Kurt is asking, uh, you did a great job hosting the 2008 Phil's uh, Zoom call recently. Uh, where you. does Charlie Manuel rank of managers you have played for? Who are your favorites and less preferable managers? <laughs> well, Charlie's my favorite. Um, you know, he was, in terms of technicalities and, and you know, statistics and, and knowing the game, I would say this with Chuck, it was good that he had Jimmy Williams on the bench with him and Rich Dubie as a pitch coach, pitching coach, because those guys were masters of numbers. That was not Charlie Manuel. He, he was a master of feeling the game, knowing hitters, knowing when to, um, you know, the, the, the very, I guess, ultimate old school manager where he would just watch the game and make calls based on his instinct. And uh, he was fantastic at it, but also the, the best players manager ever and, and that he just simply did not care what the media thought. He only cared about his relationship with the players. And, you know, it, it got to a point where um, I think players that played for him for a couple of years, um, they would die for the dude because he just, he had such incredible loyalty. Some people said to a fault at times, but he had such incredible loyalty to the players. He didn't care at all about what the media thought. He never made a decision based on the media. And I've played for other managers and, uh, 
you know, look, I mean, uh, I liked Phil Garner a lot in Houston, but I think that, you know, he wasn't uh, uh, trying to figure out the right way to say this. You know, I think he made moves every once in a while that were based on, as a new manager, some pressure kind of getting to him or, or you know, media kind of saying some things or the front office kind of saying some things. And that's not as typical of a player's manager. Um, so Charlie, Man so I'm not, I like Phil Garner as a person. I really do. Um, I don't know that maybe he was one of my favorite managers. I would say probably not. Um, but Charlie Manuel certainly was at the top for me. Um, and I don't really have any beef or anything like that with, with any of the managers I, I ever played for. I, I like most of them. They're all good in their own ways. Um, I didn't play for a ton. Fortunately for me, I kind of had Jimmy Williams and then uh, Phil Garner and, and, you know, then, then moved into uh, uh, moved into Philly and had Charlie Manuel. Um, uh, and then my last year with the nationals um, I had Davey Johnson and I would probably say I like Davey a lot, uh, but he is the one that ended my career by, uh, you know, calling me in the office and saying, we got to make a move. And it happens for every player at some point. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, that's my, my biggest memory with Davey Johnson, but I do like Davey Johnson. I understand why he made the move. I was, I was banged up and not performing well. So that's kind of what happens at the very end of your career. Um, so I, I, I really like the managers I have. I, I guess I wouldn't really say I didn't like any of them personally, but Charlie Manuel is just on another level in terms of a relationship uh, that I had with him. And, and I think that he has with a lot of his players. Just watching uh, last night, um, uh, Kevin Costner is uh, – getting called in as Crash Davis to be released by, you know, from the minor leagues, just right. you know, last night right. watching it. It's okay. a horrible feeling. <laughs> yeah. The next uh, couple of questions are kind of circling back to the state of the game right now. This is from Macklin Klaus. And the question is, uh, will the short summer camp be advantageous for the pitchers or for the hitters? That's a great question. I, I think it'll be more advantageous, um, for the hitters, um, I think guys in the bullpen don't need a long, you know, duration to get ready. So I don't think they're going to suffer a ton, but I think you're going to see starting pitchers have the biggest disadvantage. So um, I don't know if the hitters are going to have a massive, adva massive advantage. I think it's more advantageous for them, but starting pitchers, certainly, um, you, know, you look at Max Scherzer last night, he, he was kind of battling his last couple outings of that summer camp. Normally in a regular spring training, he would have several more outings to kind of right the ship and to really get locked in before the season. He was missing his spots quite a bit last night, didn't have those extra couple games to get locked in. And so I think you're going to see that with a lot of starting pitchers that their command isn't where it normally is. Now, I'm not talking about stuff. I'm saying more of their command isn't going to be what they're normally used to when the season starts. So I think you're going to see starting pitchers uh, affected more than anybody else. And on the other side, if you're Garrett Cole, his stuff is so good, it just doesn't even matter. I would normally say that about Scherzer too, but Garrett Cole's stuff right now is like on another planet. So um, he was able to make a few mistakes and miss some spots and not get hurt. Okay. The next question, and we touched on this a little bit, is from uh, Jeff Davis. Um, Brad, uh, are there any 2020 rule changes that we should continue retaining for the future? You talked about starting extras in with a guy on second. Yeah, not what that about, one. What about things we should keep? Um, in terms of things that we should keep, I, I do like the designated hitter this year. I, I know that it, I'm kind of on, on both on, on the fence on this one a little bit, but recently I've come around to it. Um, I like baseball, you know, in its purest form. So pitchers hitting fine, but you'll eventually get to a spot in, in, in professional sports to where baseball has to be able to keep up with the action of the NFL and the NBA who can change rules at the drop of a hat and not have to worry about if this era compares, you know, to what other era baseball is always comparing era to era. And that's a good thing. I think that baseball has that, but at some point baseball has to be okay with moving forward and, and saying, you know what, we need to be able to change some rules. We need to create more offense. It's going to get younger generations involved. The demographics demographics for MLB and, and kids right now are really bad. Kids are not watching baseball. Um, and, you know, baseball has to figure out a way to get them involved because when they grow up, okay, maybe they'll, you know, go back to it, but maybe not. Uh, and, and so baseball has to figure out a way to create the action. You know, this is where we are as a society. I mean, whether you like it or not, kids like things that are fast paced. Kids like offensive games. They want to see that. And so baseball can do little things here and there. 
uh, to do that that don't impact the game in a major level. And I think bringing the DH to the National League will create a little more excitement, a little more offense, and all it does is just make it so that both leagues are the same. So I, I don't have any problem with that. I don't have an issue with that. I also think not 16 teams the way they have it this year, but maybe 12 or 14 teams for the postseason from here on out will be a good idea because it'll bring in more more people. Now, I don't like that it's 16 teams because that's what the NBA does. And it feels like every single team in the NBA, even if you're 10 games under 500, you're in the playoffs. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. You should be a good team to get to the playoffs, not a, not an average team or a bad team. So they need to reduce the 16 games, but they can maybe do 12 or maybe 14. And I would be okay with that too. Okay. Our next question is from David Berry, who asks, what is your favorite piece of memorabilia from your playing days? Well, uh, I'll tell you what, you guys are in the man cave with me right now. Um, I don't know if you can see some of the balls I have behind my shoulder. Oh, is that what that is? Uh, it is. I, I've got a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, I've got a lot of junk around here. I, I'll try and kind of wheel Hello. it around a little bit. It's a lot of, lot of jerseys and stuff. I'll, I'll tell you what, um, trying to narrow it down to my favorite piece at this moment would be pretty tough. I do have... Um, from the 2006 World Baseball Classic. Uh, it was the first ever World Baseball Classic. And uh, I don't know going forward, I know that one's already canceled for next year, but um, it, it was an incredible team. Now we got bounced out pretty early by Japan in that, and it really was a massive upset. But I have a, a pair of shoes that, um, that everybody autographed on that. And every, I told people to leave comments if they wanted to. So it's actually like, you know, it would be like an autograph from like, you know, Derek Jeter or whatever. And he'd end up saying like, you know, go Notre, go Irish or something because like, he liked Notre Dame a lot. So um, I had people leave some comments and it just made it really personal. And for me, that's kind of one of my favorite things is, is when I'd ask a guy to sign something, I'd always make sure that I knew the guy well enough to know that, Hey, you know, leave something on it if you want and, and, and kind of mess around with it. I have a, uh, in that same vein, I have a John Smoltz jersey uh, from 2004, and he was closing at that time with the Braves. And him and I went back and forth on a, I think, two-plus inning outing uh, in one of the games in, in Houston. And uh, we had both done real well in our two innings. No, nobody gave up any base runners except I gave up one hit, and it was to Smoltz who hit, uh, who hit a rocket off me. And uh, so he wrote on the jersey, you know, he made some comments about that and he said some good stuff. But, um, you know, I think for me, just kind of having that that personal touch on on some of the memorabilia as I look around here, I'm trying to see some other things. I have some other things that kind of from off the field that I was fortunate enough to have. But um, but from the field, uh, those personal touches were always the best. Okay, Uh, this is from Frank Collins and. um... This is, we've kind of touched on some of this, but uh, Frank is asking, are there any thresholds in place that if met would cause the season to be canceled? And if so, what are they? Well, great question. I'm not aware that there are any exact thresholds. I I really feel like baseball is kind of set out to to say that we're going to be playing by and large, um, even if things get pretty ugly this year, because they feel... Baseball feels like it can do a good enough job keeping its players healthy. If we start to see increased levels of of positive tests during uh, four players um, that maybe reach a 10% or 15%, something like that would definitely be a threshold. Um, And so, you know, while it's not exactly in writing, um, we have a very low amount of uh, of players testing positive at the moment. If you start to see an increase in that, um, you know, to where maybe even 5%, all of a sudden baseball will have to take a step back and reassess. And if it gets to something like 5 to 10%, I think that they, that would be something that would cause them to stop. Okay. Next question from Karen. And she asks, what are stories of some of the baseballs in the background, circling back to your background there? Well, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I've, uh, I have, I have a bunch of them. And basically the only thing I can say is that, um, it's, it's guys that either I had a ton of respect for and never met, um, or, or, you know, hall of fame, hall of fame type guys or, uh, guys that I knew. So for example, uh, you wouldn't necessarily find a ball in my collection from, uh, somebody that I didn't have a lot of respect for that maybe was a hall of famer. Uh, but guys that I really love, like I have one from, uh, like, for example, Ernie Banks, who was at the uh, 2008 All-Star Game, and he was my, my parents' favorite player growing up. They're from Chicago. 
And, uh, you know, he, he wrote some real nice stuff on it. And, uh, you know, so I tried to get guys that, that I knew uh, well or that I had a ton of respect for uh, in, in the collection. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's some other stuff, too. There's some guys that came into our clubhouse uh, at different times uh, that, that I was able to talk to that maybe weren't necessarily related to baseball. I know, like, David Beckham came in, and we had some conversation for a while. So I got one from him, got, like, a, you know, a John Daly – uh, ball in there. Um, uh, President Bush would come into our uh, clubhouse quite a bit in Houston. So I got some uh, ball. I got two balls from him, one from my dad, one from me. Um, so, and, and then actually maybe my favorite one, uh, which I should have maybe mentioned is uh, one that is from Houston and the, uh, the astronaut crew uh, actually took it to, uh, took this baseball to outer space uh, in 2006. And uh, um and I can't remember exactly all the people on the crew, but they brought it actually into outer space. And I wrote on the ball, I said, I hope no one ever hits one this far off me when they were, when they were hovering <laughs> around. And uh, they made like a really cool little DVD video that they gave me as well, where they're like throwing the ball in their, you know, gravity uh, uh cockpit of the, of the shuttle. And the ball is just kind of moving through the air real slowly. And, and somebody hits the ball like this and it kind of moves back through the air uh, and it's, it was a really cool thing. The best thing about it is now this is, I, I guess, between all of us, technically, when you, when you bring something to outer space, it has to be retained with NASA for then or on out. You're not allowed to bring anything back, but they did give me the ball. So I still have it. And, uh, you know, I can say it's, it's been to, to outer space and, uh, I'm not supposed to have, you know, have it. So it feels kind of cool to have there in my, uh, in my cabinets. Well, uh, Brad, your, your secret is uh, safe with Rocky Mountain Saber. <laughs> right. So don't tell anybody, right. <laughs> And whoever we tell, we'll make sure they don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> right, good. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, next, the ne next question, the last one that's posted here before we go to the hand, uh, hand uh, thing, is from Bill Abba, who is our chapter treasurer, and he asks, "How disruptive to a player's normal rhythm is the ban on seeds, smokeless tobacco, spitting, etc.? Athletes tend to be creatures of habit." Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question because, uh, it definitely is something you're going to have to rewire your head around. Now, I, I hope that nobody is, you know, in such a state that if they don't chew some sunflower seeds in the third inning, they just can't get out there and pitch or, or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, I think that's not necessarily the case, but certainly it is the case that will affect their routine and they're going to have to kind of rewire and, and re circuit here to be able to, to get over that. I had my routine where I always chewed sunflower seeds for the first four innings uh, and I flicked pumpkin seeds and, and the grounds crew hated me because I'd always flick them onto the field and then in the fifth or sixth inning I'd chew three pieces of double bubble and then uh, throw it out in the seventh inning and then start stretching and getting ready to maybe pitch in the game so um, uh, is a superstition or routine that's always the million dollar question but whatever the case I have something I did pretty much almost my entire career uh, so not having that all of a sudden would be an impact. I'd have to kind of figure out something to take its place. Uh, but again, you know, you better figure it out. It's not like you can say, look, if, if I can't, if I can't have my seeds, I'm not playing this year. Like, I don't think that's going to fly with anybody. So uh, you got to just figure out how to, how to get around it. Okay. Um, uh, now I want to go back to Alex and Alex, uh, if you want to, if anybody has another question for Brad, they can just uh, hit the uh, hand function. Is that uh, sure? Talk? I will. I will unmute them if they they raise their hand. Okay. So anybody wants a question for Brad Lidge, just raise your hand. Up. Oh, this. Okay. Kurt. Kurt raised his hand. Well, he's got to raise his hand electronically. Oh. Great. <laughs> I can't see everybody. Oh. Can I? I can. Can I unmute Kurt? No. You might be able to if you can't. Uh, yeah, uh, Kurt did. Okay. I can unmute him. Yeah. Okay, we're trying to unmute Kurt here. <clears throat> I got it. There you go. Okay. In light of uh, Daniel Bard uh, coming back, uh, I'm thinking the Rockies could use you. You got any thoughts of following in Daniel Bard's footsteps? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I, 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 uh, I don't think it's uh, quite as possible for me um, based on, uh, you know, pitching to Little League. So my son's 11. He plays in, in Little League around town. And, um, 
and it can, you know, tournament stuff going on right now. And I, I'll tell you what, some of these 11 year olds, like they, they want me, they, they want me to challenge them a little bit and they'll say, you know, throw it harder, throw it harder. And we'll get up to a certain spot into which all of a sudden they're not as comfortable anymore. Uh, yeah. But normally after I do that, and of course I'll kind of, you know, get further away from them. But normally after I do that, uh, you know, the next day, my, my arms hanging a little bit. So <laughs> I, I said it like this when I was in with the Phillies, this spring training, uh, you know, before things broke out, I went down with the Phillies and, and uh, was an instructor down there. And uh, I was actually just messing around throwing a, uh, a bullpen to one of our, you know, kind of minor league catchers. It was just kind of for fun. And I actually felt pretty good while I was throwing it. I didn't necessarily have thoughts of a comeback, but it, I, would, I was felt surprisingly good. The next day, I could not wipe my bottom. We'll put it that way. It was, it was, a, it was, my arm was cashed and like I had no chance of being able to do that on back-to-back -back days or anything like that. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, maybe if I, if I had one inning in me, I'd love to be able to get out there, but I don't think a comeback is, is well, well, the thing with you is you, um, if I'm not mistaken until that last season, when you mentioned getting called into the manager's office, you'd put up great numbers your seasons before that, you know, the prior season, even before. And was it injury related? So, it, you know, it, there was a, uh, yeah, thank you. And there was a, there was kind of a gradual decrease in stuff as well. I, uh, in 2011, um, I actually tore my rotator cuff and elected to not have surgery on it, but to try and rehab it. Uh, Cause if I, if I did have the surgery, I'd be out for the year. Um, if I didn't, I might be able to pitch the last like 30% of the season. And so that's what I rehabbed for. And I came in there and I didn't throw a ton of games. Uh, Ryan Madsen had, you know, got the closer role in Philly that year. Uh, but I was kind of setting up and, and, and it was, it, it felt good. I was getting good results, but the velocity was like 90, 91. And I'd been pitching in the mid nineties, most of my career. Um, I tried to do everything I could that off season to rehab and to get velocity back. When I went to Washington, I actually tore my lower ab muscle in spring training and kind of pitched through that. Uh, during the, the first part of the season with the Nationals. But at that point, my velocity was now going down to like 89, 90. And I had never really pitched at that level. I had never really, uh, you know, been able to kind of master the craft of a, of a crafty pitcher, if you will. And coming out of the bullpen, uh, you got to have good stuff. And uh, so it, it, was, it was some injuries that kind of did me in and then a gradual decrease in, in velocity that happened pretty fast, actually, with, with the torn rotator cuff and the torn abdomen muscle. And you know, at that point, I just didn't have a whole lot that I could that I could get out there on the field. My body had kind of let me know that was it, and it made it a little bit easier to retire uh, when you have injuries versus you know when you still feel good, but you, it's hard to let the game go. I could just add uh, something to that. Uh, on many occasions, I've uh, <clears throat> run into Brad in the north weight room of the North Boulder Rec Center, and the guy is still cut. You know, he and he's <laughs> and he's not yet forty four, so. You know, he's being modest. Give it some thought, Brad. And, you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah. I'll give it a Paul, little. Paul, we have a question from uh, Greg Petty. I'll unmute him. Yeah. Does he realize? Oh. Hi, Brad. Uh, th thanks for coming today. You've been very interesting and articulate. Uh, I have one comment and then two just straight questions. I read this week that Fox is going to have CGI full crowds when they do their TV broadcast, which just sort of, it's one thing to see a few cutouts there. Uh, I just, you, you can comment on that if you want. And the other two questions are, do you have any idea how baseball is going to treat the teams that were going to be over the cap this year and whether this is, whether they're just going to, okay. you know, forgive this and not, use the cap or try to use a percentage cap or or whatever because it you know there are consequences to that and there are only four or five that we're going to be so the other question is the owner said it was a big deal to get the uh, players to promise they wouldn't sue for bad faith bargaining do you know whether the players plan to sue for that um well to, to i guess the salary cap question is interesting i have not heard how mlb is going to handle that um I'm guessing they're going to kind of maybe let some of that slide this year a little bit. I, I don't exactly know how and to what capacity. I'm sure there'll still be some kind of, it might just be a prorated thing where whatever the, you know, their, their penalty was for an entire season, it might just get dwindled down to the games that are played. Uh, just like everything seems to be prorated. That could very well be the case with that. I haven't heard anything different. Um, 
So, but, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, let's see, in terms of, of the good faith bargaining, I, the, um, as I said before, I don't feel like the owners bargained in good faith and the players union certainly did not feel that way. However, I do believe that was one of the, um, one of the essential factors to getting this deal done is that the players would not sue for, for not bargaining in good faith. So I think that the players union was able to kind of drop that and what they're going to do is bring it up in a major way at the next collective bargaining. Uh, but I don't think you're going to see any kind of uh, lawsuit toward the owners and MLB for not bargaining in good faith, even though it seemed pretty clear that that's what was going on. Uh, and then finally the fans, um, I think it's going to look silly. I, I, don't think I don't think baseball has to do that. I think CGI fans, it's gonna we're, we're probably gonna see some glitches, uh, you know, some weird looking stuff out there, and and it's gonna be strange. I don't think they need to do that. It will make the game seem more important. I understand why they're trying to do it, like because right now it kind of feels like you're watching spring training games a little bit, uh, and they are gonna want people tuning in to feel like the game is important. So they're gonna fake fans being there. I, I don't know that that's necessary to do. We next have a question or a hand raised from Fran Frazier. So I will unmute her. Yes. As far as pitching, uh, of course, you pitched as a young child or even as a kid in, at this elevation. But after you were in the major leagues for a while, you came back and pitched in Denver. And did it change? Did you notice the change? Um, so that's a good question because I, I, people have asked me before, shouldn't the Rockies draft guys that have pitched in Colorado because, you know, they know how to pitch in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, well, here's what happens. Um, no matter if the Rockies draft you or whoever else drafts you, you go to spring training in Arizona or Florida. You pitch a lot at that altitude. Then you go and play in the minor leagues where, you know, nothing is the altitude of Colorado. And you have to really – so maybe you've pitched a little bit in high school in, in, in Colorado, 60 innings maybe your senior year, uh, and then all of a sudden you go pitch 140 innings at a minor league place at sea level, and then that's A ball, and then another 140 innings at high A, and then another 100 innings in double A, and another 150 innings. So by the time you actually get to the major leagues, you are not the same guy at all that you were that pitched out of high school or that pitched in, at altitude before. You've completely reworked everything to pitch – at sea level because that's what you're used to seeing and that's where the vast vast majority of your career and your innings now have happened um, so then all of a sudden you're back at you know in, in Coors Field if you're lucky enough to get to the major leagues and you're armed with a completely different set of pitches um, so you have to kind of relearn it but it's not an easy thing to do uh, certainly probably a little bit of experience would help if you came out of here from high school or something but you've remastered your craft entirely so it's it, it's it's you know, and still that being said, only half your games are at altitude. The other half you're pitching at sea level. So it's really hard. That's, that's why it's so hard on pitchers to pitch here because it really is two different ways of pitching everywhere else. Like if I pitch in Philadelphia and I'm used to pitching at sea level, I only have one exception to that through the year. And that's when I pitch in Colorado, but the Rockies pitchers have to do half their games in Colorado. So they have to have, you know, that type of pitching and they have to pitch on the road at sea level and they have to have that kind of master too. And I know that you don't want to change things going back and forth, but I've, I have found pitching in Denver, you really do have to change things in your approach when you pitch here. So um, it's just a lot more for a pitcher to handle knowing that he's going to have to pitch two different ways through the course of the season. Paul, it looks like we have a follow-up question from Chris Moyer in the chat yep. room. Is it okay if I read it? Go ahead. So uh, Chris Moyer asks, Brad, how choppy do you see the waters for Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball negotiations this offseason in regards to the contraction plans? And second question, and would some of those issues linger into the Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball Player Association dispute after the 2021 season? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's really sad what's happening right now in the minor leagues. Um, there are, there's a lot of contraction. Um, Owners have realized they don't need to have as many minor league affiliates. It doesn't benefit them financially. And so they've just kind of cut off a lot of loose ends, if you will, in that direction. And uh, I see that being extraordinarily choppy. Um, you know, there is right now the minor league uh, players association or, or their, their union um, 
has been filing tons of grievances trying to get fair um, labor wages for the hours that players are at the field because it's so extraordinarily low compared to any other job in America. Um, and I hope they're successful with, with trying to do that. I think they've made some headway there for sure. Uh, but it is, you know, the minor league players are already getting a, a, a paid peanuts. Uh, and then, you know, you have all these teams contracting some of the levels. So um, minor leagues are, you know, is, is, if somebody wants to say the major leagues are in bad shape right now, the minor leagues are in worse shape. And uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to figure out how to get this thing going. I, I don't see a good uh, ending for minor league affiliates because I don't think they can really, at the end of the day, just like if, if a professional team doesn't want to have them, then they're not going to have them because the owners are going to make a decision. They own the league or they own the affiliate. So that includes the, the major league team and the minor league teams. Um, and it's at the end of the day, it's their decision on, on to cut, uh, to cut ties with them if they want. Um, yeah. Some of those issues will linger into the major league baseball uh, players associate the collective bargaining after 2021. Um, I don't see those being as major of an issues as everything else that's on the table, because once you're kind of in the major leagues, the, the minor leagues seem to, kind of be a different world away. Uh, but the minor leagues certainly will have their disputes. And uh, I hope, I for one, hope they really are able to, uh, to do a heck of a lot better because it's, it's, the disparity is so ridiculous now that it, it, it's almost like a different world, uh, you know, minor leagues versus the major leagues. So I hope they're able to clean that up. I really do. Uh, we have a follow-up question from David Barry. Um, Brad should, uh, bear with me, sorry. Should Pete Rose be considered for the Hall of Fame? Sounds like this is a personal opinion. Yeah. Um, you know, I've gone back and forth on this, but I think um, at the end of the day, you know, it's funny. I, I, I could make a good argument either way. But, but I'll say today I'll say yes, uh, you know, because um, I, I feel like we are going to continue to measure things on and off the field. Uh, I feel like we're a more forgiving society uh, these days. I don't forgive what Pete Rose did uh, for sure. And what he did obviously is something that was on the field and, and affected the game of play. So there's the kind of sticking point. But um, I think that if you take his body of work as a player, it's really, really tough to deny it. And, and here's the thing. If we're going to let guys in that, that we know or we're like almost positive, that tested positive for, for PEDs, and we're going to say, well – you know, we're, we got to if Barry Bonds gets in the Hall of Fame, how are you going to say that, that, you know, he should be in there and, and Pete Rose shouldn't? I, I think the argument gets really tough to make at that point. Um, so I'm going to say yes, and I think it's kind of heading that way. The guys that we know did PEDs uh, are going to end up getting in. Um, and so if that's the case, then I, I think the doors need to be open to Pete Rose too. Do we have time for one more question, Paul? Sure. Is that um, okay, Brad? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Brad. Um, follow question from Chris Cohen. For the minor league teams that get cut, how likely do you believe it is they it, it is they join an independent league or potentially start their own independent league? Well, I think it's very likely uh, that they do that. Um, <clears throat> you know, you still have a massive facility, a ballpark uh, that employs a lot of people uh, locally. And it's important to keep that up and running for a lot of these smaller towns. Uh, so I think you will see them continue to play ball at that park, whether it's for an independent league. Um, I don't know if they'll be able to start their own independent league unless they're all closely related in proximity. Um, because for independent league teams, uh, they, they need to be closely, you know, cl in close proximity. Um, and I think that they're going to kind of be end up being scattered. But I, I do think they'll end up trying to figure out a way to get those fields connected to an independent league or, or something else because, you, you know, again, it's a big facility. Every one of these minor league stadiums is a big operation that employs a lot of people locally. And any local town is going to want to keep that going. I believe that's it for now, Paul. Okay. Um, um, well, I first I want to – Thank uh, Brad Lidge for his uh, time and his uh, his uh, input. Uh, he's uh, it's just a joy to listen to. He's articulate, super intelligent, and and just a good guy. And and a, and a, you know we're proud of you as a as a Coloradan. And um, thank very you. Very much appreciate your uh, your joining us today. Well, it was a lot of fun actually. I, I had a really good time and. Uh... All my experiences with Sabre have been great, so my pleasure and uh, great 
educated questions. I expect nothing less from you guys. So uh, very well done. And uh, it was very enjoyable for me as well. Now, uh, I think we're going to stay on uh, for those who want to stay on a little longer. And Brad, you're certainly welcome to join us. We're going to uh, open it up for a more general baseball discussion. So, yeah, I, well, I, I would say this. I, I am going to take my son to play a par three golf course uh, <laughs> very shortly here. And I need to we have a tea time. I'm going to get some lunch in me first. So I might I might bounce off, but you can okay. certainly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to jump back in here next time. Thanks so much, Brad. All Thank right, you, Paul, have a good one. Thank you all. It was fun. Okay. All right. Uh, we can open it up to uh, anybody who has general comment. John, Paul, did you raise your hand? Oh, no. Okay. Yep. Uh, feel free to continue sending in uh, chat comments or questions or raise your hand. I can multitask. Uh, Oh, well, I, we may be all talked out here. <laughs> oh, oh, there's a hand, Frank Collins. Frank Collins, let me find you, sir. There you are. I'm, I'm back here in Pennsylvania. And I remember when the Rockies came into existence and everybody talked about the thin air, the, the home runs, uh, you know, just the uniqueness of being in the thin air. Was this considered even before the, the stadium was built? I mean, was this ta something taken, I guess, were they taken by surprise by this? Or is this uh, something that was going to be well known? The fact that the thin air was going to affect things so much. If anyone wants to jump in, Paul, you can lead. Or anyone wants to jump yeah. in, on. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I know that when, um, uh, you know, People uh, looked at the, the statistics over the years of the minor league team here, the, the Denver Bears for many years, and then later the Denver Zephyrs. And um, it, it just seemed like Denver played uh, statistically kind of middle of the pack. And it wasn't until the, the Rockies came into existence and started playing Major League Baseball at elevation that all the physicists were trotted out. And it was determined that um, there was a general consensus that a, a batted ball traveled 9% further here. And I think as a, re, a, gen, a result of that consensus, Coors Field uh, ended up with uh, the largest outfield in Major League Baseball in terms of square footage. And of course, that's, that's a double-edged sword because if you move the fences back, what happens? You have more singles and doubles in front of, in front of the outfielders. So um, it's, an, it's really a... People were aware of it, and, and I think that conversation and that debate goes on to this day. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Kurt looks like he's, let me get Kurt. Uh, it, in response to Frank's question, and Paul, you're right. I mean, it's something that uh, was kind of, you know, talked about a little bit, but for the most part, it really took till Mile High Stadium, the first year with the Rockies, for it really to come to light like it was. I, I had a roommate in college who ended up pitching five years in the majors, but he went off during college to pitch in the Cape Cod League. And he came back and was talking about the difference in pitching at altitude and not it was news to us. I mean, we'd never thought much about that. They're just, I, you know, I followed the Denver Bears or the Zephyrs or whoever, and and uh, they, ha they actually had some pretty good pitching on those teams back then too. They were maybe higher scoring, but we got some really good pitching performances. But that was, it just wasn't as prevalent until we got the Rockies that it really came to light. So it, it certainly, as they were building the stadium, there wasn't a lot of talk about building it for altitude at the time. It wasn't a major determining factor although the fences you know were a little bit further you know once we constructed it at Coors Field but that had already been determined those fences at Mile High Stadium based on the the uh, rotating left field bleachers and so forth you know. Paul and Kurt we had a follow-up question uh, comment from Rod Nelson on this matter wasn't Dr. Uh, Robert Adair consulted prior to Coors Field design? Yes the Yale physicist yes he was uh, he was the, um, the greatest authority, if you will, in, in, the, 
in the area of baseball physics. Um, and uh, he, he was uh, looked upon as um, um, the final word, if you will. But I don't think there's ever really ever been a final word. You know, Brad Lidge touched on something interesting that the Rockies, that faced the Rockies, where the team, both pitchers and catchers who did on the Rockies who were dealing with uh, altitude, play half their games at altitude and half, half their games at sea level. And it, it's fine in terms of if you go to sea level from altitude and there's an adjustment to be made with uh, hand-eye coordination and muscle memory. And what happens after that adjustment is made? You're on the road for a week or 10 days. You come back to Denver and you have to make another adjustment. And in the normal course of a normal season, there are approximately 26 times when you go from home to road and back to home. And that's something the Rockies uh, franchise, and now they're beginning their 28th season tonight, uh, have always had to deal with. And uh, no, uh, none of the other 29 major league teams have to deal, deal with it at all. So it's an ongoing um, a challenge for this franchise, and it has been since day one. Well, the Arizona Diamondbacks um, are a little bit above sea level at, like, I believe, 1,500 feet. But to your point, Paul, it's not the same. It's just not the same. I think Bill's raising his hand. Oh, Bill, Mr. Bill Abba. You know, Paul mentioned the uh, – can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Because I, I can't hear myself at the moment. Uh, Paul mentioned about the physicists uh, uh, jumping on board, you know, after we got a little experience with it. If you look at the physics, um, they take multiple factors into consideration. It's not just the altitude. It's also the humidity, you know, hitting the ball in drier air and all of that. But the one thing they didn't take into consideration was the impact on the ball. And so we saw, we also saw, getting back to Frank's question, uh, uh, we saw a, a, a difference when we started uh, with the humidor as well, uh, because we were adjusting the ball for uh, for for the altitude. So you know that's another factor, and it took it took years. Uh, I, I don't know why, whether it was a matter of getting permission to do it or or uh, uh, just kind of deciding what to do about it when they realized the problem, but. Uh, uh, turning the ball from a rock into something a little bit more normal for the game. Uh, and that made a huge difference too. I, I think it, uh, somebody had to come up with the idea. And, and um, the, the humidor, the idea for the humidor was actually uh, came up with uh, a guy by the name of Tony Cowell, who was uh, still with the Rockies. He's in the engineering department. And um, it was really his idea that uh, launched the humidor movement. Have we, have we exhausted, have we exhausted this group? <laughs> Possibly. Mr. Petty, uh, do you have anything uh, else you wanted to touch on or? Well, Greg did send a comment, Paul. He said, uh, Brad was really impressive and thank you Paul for getting him and for doing such a fine job of interviewing him. So thank you, Greg. I got one last question. Herb, how are you doing with this DH? <laughs> Do you want me to unmute? Still, still going to follow him? <laughs> Let me unmute Mr. Shankman. Hold on. I think I got it. You got yeah. it, sir. Yeah, I try not to think about the DH. <laughs> being being old and a purist, I still don't like it. Yeah, but I can see, like Brad said, I can see because it's it's for the fans. Uh, offense is the thing they like, not the two to one games, the three to one. They don't like National League baseball. They like a lot of hitting, a lot of home runs, and certainly the DH has a lot to do with that. No, yeah. That's my feeling. Uh, I would like to say one thing about uh, pitching at altitude, because I go back to the old Western League, and I can remember 
being on the Topeka, Kansas team, when we came to the Springs, Colorado Springs, I don't believe there was a pitcher on our staff that could break a curveball when we came here. And we, of course, Topeka's sea level and the Springs is 6,800 feet or something like that. It's even worse than here. But pitching was difficult. And it's a wonder that pitchers coming from sea level to altitude didn't get more sore arms trying to snap off some of the breaking pitches that weren't breaking with normal reaction or normal arm speed. So uh, it is difficult to pitch. And I don't know who brought it up, but pitching 26 different times, moving from altitude to, to sea level and sea level back to altitude, uh, that's a great adjustment. And it's really tough on the body. So, and of course, now they've improved it. We didn't know what a humidor was <laughs> in those days and had no idea that the skin of the wall was going to be a lot drier in Colorado Springs than it was in Lincoln or uh, in Topeka. So it, I don't think that's ever going to change, having pitching the same. But it has improved because we see better breaking pitches at altitude now. And I think the humidor has a lot to do with that. Herb, we have a, a comment from uh, Shannon Blair, I believe. Uh, she wants to first ask you, have you ever played a game of catch with Brad? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm Do you too want old. To? <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I don't know if it was, the, was it the last uh, meeting we had or the, when Bud was, when Bud Black and Bud said he'd play catch with me. But <laughs> I need somebody to catch the ball. <laughs> there's, there's no uh, hand and eye coordination anymore. I can still does. throw it. Herb, that could be a range. I, but... I don't know if I could reach him, but I could still throw it. <laughs> can you throw? And uh, Paul Shannon has a follow up question: Has anyone made predictions for Rocky's win loss record this year? So are we going to have some sort of any contest? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's too crazy, too crazy. Got anything else there? Oh, Bill's got another one, sorry. Unmute. Yeah, I, I wanted to react to the, to the question to Herb about uh, the DH. You know, when we had John Thorne a couple of months ago, uh, he was asked about, about the DH and he said he'd, he'd come around to it. He, he, like to see it happen because he was I think the way he put it he says I'm disgusted with with the experience of try, of watching pitchers try to hit and within a couple of days and this was in a, a little email conversation several of us were having a, a couple of weeks ago um, the first reference I found to, to, to the DH was from the Sporting News in uh, 1893 I think it was and uh, it, it, was, it was basically the same comment that, that Mr. Thorne made. Uh, it, it was from Connie Mack. And he said, you know, it, what it boiled down to was basically if, if pitchers aren't going to uh, take the time and make the effort to actually try to do something constructive at the plate, we might as well not have them hit. Uh, so it, it, it's not a recent topic uh, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's, uh, I don't know whether that means it's something whose, whose time has come for everybody. I'm kind of a purist too, but uh, um, it's interesting that it actually goes back that far. Yeah, Bill, That's yesterday, A-Rod a pointed out that pitchers in the playoffs last year were one for 60. Yeah. That's not very good, is it? I don't think that's, so. That's not real good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Paul, well, I think we've reached. Go Brad, Brad also brought up the point of, it, you know, maybe it's time to have the two leagues play under the same rules, you know, because, you know, you even you get to the World Series and, and home games and, you know, in the American League have the DH and 
and National League home games don't. So maybe it's time to unify that. Yes, sir, Alex. I just think I think we've reached our time limit. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to thank uh, um, Alex Marks, uh, first and foremost, for doing a, a marvelous job uh, coordinating this Zoom call. And for all of you who had uh, really good questions, it seemed like Brad, uh, beyond being polite, Brad Lidge just said, uh, oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. And they were. It's a, it's a you know, a, a good group. We have a strong chapter and, and, uh, and a, a good group of baseball minds assembled here. And thank you all so much for joining us today. So thank you. Well, Be safe, everybody. Everybody stay safe. Okay.